They can be the carriers of God's blessing and become God's witnesses everywhere. It's an amazing thing. I wrote this. This is the next one, sorry. Yeah. I wrote this 1989. So I could I started to see this development that I felt was very, very important. Um, next. Political belief, rather than political power, began to be the cement that held Jewish society together, especially in the diaspora. The redemption of Israel lay entirely in God's hand. When that happened, it would be by the spiritual divine intervention and by no human hand. Now, so far for the Jewish uh, development within the Hebrew scriptures, it's very clear that they have moved from the tribal and exclusive to the um, and the exclusive to the inclusive part. But for us Christians, the new, we, we enter into the New Testament and then let us look at the promise from a New Testament perspective, which is very, very interesting. And unfortunately, most Christian Zionists who are dealing with those texts that I mentioned about the promise of the land in the Genesis accounts, they don't realize the revolution that had taken place in the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, let's look at the next. Now, we are in Galatians, written by the Apostle Paul. So he says, and please pay attention, because this is where I think it's very important for us to realize. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. You remember I told you pay attention to the word offspring. It does not say and to offsprings, as of many, but it says and to your offspring, that is to one person who is Christ. So the, the, the Christian revolution says, it's Christ who's the offspring of Abraham. So the land belongs to Christ. Now, Jews do not have to accept this, obviously. But for Christians, if they want to be true to scripture, this is what we have. The offspring of Abraham, Jesus Christ. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Next one. To many of you as were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or, and female. All of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Pay attention to this. It's amazing. It's a different theology. I respect the Old Testament theology, the Hebrew scripture theology, because it brought us out of the tribal into the inclusive. I respect that. And thank God for that. But for Christians, they went another step. That is now, it's a different theology. Let me just, you know, let let these texts speak to you more than I'm speaking. So let's look at the next one from Romans. For the promise that Abraham would inherit the world, the cosmos, the world, did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For this reason, it depends on faith. Now what is very interesting in this text, that there is nowhere in the Genesis accounts of the promise that God tells Abraham, you're going to inherit the cosmos, the world. There is no, you're going to inherit the land. Paul reinterprets the promise. And he says, 
that Abraham was going to inherit the world. In other words, uh, Paul was reinterpreting the promise in light of the coming of Jesus Christ. Again, it's a different theology. What amazes me is that I don't hear any Christian Zionists in this country who are always using those texts about the promise in, from Genesis. I, I, I say they are Old Testament Christians because they've never come to the New Testament. If they paid attention to the New Testament, look what the New Testament is saying. This is part of the challenge that we need to give them if they are true Christians. I don't mind if they're Jewish, we can stick to the inclusive. I have no, this is wonderful. But for Christians, they need to take a step further in accordance at least with what we are looking at here. Let me give you another text. Next. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. Again, it's talking about that the, now the promise is expanded to include, to include all people. Next. I go back to the gospel. Just one example of this. Uh, when Jesus begins his preaching, it says he was started to proclaim the good news of God and say the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. In the New Testament, amazing thing happened. The focus is no more on the land as we find in most uh, scriptures in the, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew scriptures. What is the focus here? Is on the kingdom of God. So the land is not, more, is, is not important anymore. What is important is God's kingdom. And God's kingdom means where God is sovereign anywhere. And you could live in God's kingdom whether you're in the United States or in you, you're in anywhere else, you know, where God reigns over the lives of people, where people, you know, are faithful to God in their, in their faith, in their service, in serving others. So the focus here is on the kingdom of God, not on the land. Again, the concept of the kingdom of the land expands in a great way. Now, I want to end by quoting from two groups uh, uh, of, of Friends of Sabir. The first one is the Dutch Christians. Those of you who know the, the Netherlands, you realize that one of the most difficult, probably, Friends of Sabir that came into being was our friends in Holland because they were very, very much affected by the Holocaust. And, um, and it took a long time before some of them decided to become friends of Sabir. And now they are with us in an amazing way, very active in their work. Well, they produced a document more recently, in 2012, and listen to what some of the things they've said. And we have a number of copies of this. I know some of you have a copies of that, but if you need it, I can always send it to you. We have, but most of the copies are in Jerusalem. So, what did the Friends of Sabil and Kairos Palestine Netherlands say? Next, please. Yes. Since God's love is for all people, 
God's people can spread from Israel across the whole earth and in this way the promise of the land can encompass the whole earth. Paul already saw this universal scope in the promise to Abraham when he wrote in Romans 4.13 that Abraham and his descendants were promised that they would inherit the world. Next. This universalization of the promise of the land is not a spiritualization either because it concerns real people on this real earth. Moreover, this universalization means that all people have been granted a place on this earth where they can live in safety, freedom, and peace. Are we? Is the time up? Two minutes. Okay. I will. Yeah. Let me tell you, let me introduce you just in, 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 uh, in a few words about one of the greatest documents that came out last year from the Church of Scotland. If you have not seen it, I urge you, I urge you to look at what the Church of Scotland came up with. And they called it the inheritance of Abraham with a question mark. A report on the promised land. May 2013. This is a summary of the theology of land, the, about the promise of the, the land, written by the Church of Scotland, one of our great churches. And many of them are friends of Sabir. So let's just read this uh, and I'll finish. I'll finish with it. To Christians in the 21st century, Promises about the land of Israel shouldn't be intended to be taken literally or as, fly, as applying to a defined geographical territory. They are a way of speaking about how to live under God so that justice and peace reign. The weak and the poor are protected. The stranger is included. Next. Yes, thank you. And all have share in the community and the contribution to make to it. The promised land in the Bible is not a place so much as a metaphor or how things ought to be among the people of God. This promised land can be found or built anywhere. And why, if we are going to get some cards, uh, I want to put the, the, the last two uh, slides and you can read them for yourselves because um, this is my way again about 20 years ago. I wrote this in Justice and Only Justice uh, in the way I understood again the promises of the land. So let's, uh, so let's put those and we can be gathering. So I hope my friends, I hope that at least I tried to raise, raise this question for you. I hope I have. I, if we have more time or any time, I'd love to really uh, go into some of the details but maybe some of the, we have quest, time for questions good and maybe i can see some some more yeah okay so while we're gathering the 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 cards because as i as i mentioned this is today one of the most important issues that we must address because christian zionism is still an obstacle to peacemaking and we need to address it we need the help of the pastors, the theologians, and there are many of them who can help us. And we need to invite them, just like the Church of Scotland have done a great study. I think we can do all as well. While the um, questions are being gathered, here are our first ones. What is Reverend Dr. Etik's view on divestment in Israel by the Anglican Communion? How does that have to do with 
land. land. What is the Reverend Dr. Artique's view on divestment in Israel by the Anglican Communion, and how does this relate to the Promised Land? Well, I don't think they've taken that that decision to divest. Unfortunately, some of us are very disappointed by the Anglican Anglican Church uh, or Episcopal Church. We have many wonderful people within uh, the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church were very much working for justice and peace, but uh, I am not aware that a real divestment, uh, in fact, in this presentation, I quote from, the, from a study by the, um, by the Church of England, um, and I was, not very, I was not pleased at all where, where they are. I think by far, and I say this very frankly, by far, the Church of Scotland is very, very much ahead of us, uh, very much ahead of the Anglican Church in their theology. So they're not. Another question, does the inheritance of the land to Abraham's descendants include Islam? It is possible to make a case for Islam because when the first promise was given, Isaac was not even born. The promise of the land was given to Abraham when he had Ishmael. And for Muslims, they see themselves as descendants of Ishmael. So it is possible to say that um, it included all the descendants of Abraham, and at that time the only descendant was Ishmael. It's very interesting. You know. So, but later on, those who wrote the scripture uh, make it, they begin to narrow it down to Isaac, Jacob, and, and that. So, it is possible to argue the case uh, to some extent. Please explain exile. I wonder if some may believe exodus and exile are synonymous. I was surprised to find many in our church that believe this. Exodus and exile are synonymous? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it's possible in the, in, the, uh, in the prophets, some of the prophets saw that uh, the, the return from the exile as another exodus. That's true. We find that in, the, in some of the... Um, so it's a, even a greater exodus. People like Jeremiah would, would refer to it. Um, but um, the exile is the exile, um, according at least to the record that we have in the, in the scripture. But the whole question of exile has been picked up by many Jewish writers. Uh, people like Mark Ellis and others, you know, uh, talk that they, that some Jews still feel today, those who are working for justice, for peace, they feel themselves being in exile because they're, they've been very much against the, the mainstream of things. So, uh, so again, it's a big topic to really delve in. What do we do about mainline churches who are fixated on a literal interpretation of the Bible? Yeah. It's the mainline churches, most of them are not really, um, <clears throat> they're not the ones who, at least to my knowledge, most of them are not the ones who take, uh, who look at the Bible literally. But the more probably evangelicals or extremist evangelicals who would hold that. But if you're talking about Within our mainline churches, we find Christian Zionists, yes. And I hope that in one of our workshops, I think we're going to deal with this, you know. Uh, so uh, we have a problem. It's not only our problem with the people who, are, who, who view the Bible in an inerrant, inerrant way. We have a problem within the mainline churches because many of them read the scriptures, read the Bible uh, innocently. Not critically. You need to argue with the Bible. We always argue with God. You know. And God, God loves us all. And I hope in another session 
I'm going to talk about um, uh, we need the hermeneutic, we need the criterion to, um, to check these texts. Without a criterion, we're, we're lost. How can you say, how can I say, this comes, this is a word of God for me, and on, to another text, this is not a word of God for me. How do I determine this? Living today. Is it a word of God for me to drive the people out? Or to embrace them? Is it the word of God for me to kill them? Or to live with them? I mean, this is at the heart of this study. At the heart of this study. That's why, you know, it's amazing that these wonderful uh, ancient Israelites in their religious, developing religious thought, they came to the point of rejecting the tribal and the exclusive and began to embrace the inclusive. God is not only their God, God of all. And this begins to develop around the exile, around the time of the exile. And we did not know this. Thank God for the scholars who taught us this, who did the research. So it's a very important thing. It is an amazing, uh, once you get into this, it's so exciting and amazing. You know, I get excited every time I talk about it. It sounds like it. <laughs> In pointing to the Roman text, how do we avoid the charge that we are saying the church supersedes the Jewish people? I know the history of that, and there has been a long history and very sad history. But I think today we can really say we did not supersede. God is working with all people, with all nations, in all countries. You know, and God never stops dealing with any, any, any nation, including the Jewish people. And so it is true, we have certain texts in the New Testament that could reflect that kind of a thing. I think in our theology, it is theology that can help us here. It's not the Bible. Many times. The Bible can raise certain questions that we do not know how to answer or we do not accept. I tell you, what helps me is my theology of God in, for me as a Christian in Jesus Christ. So I look at that and it can help me. And I think this theology when it deals with God, I don't think God has abandoned the Jewish people. God does not abandon anyone. We abandon God, but it's not God who abandons us. God's love embraces all of us, including the Jewish people, and the Muslims, and the Christians, and everybody, and the secular, the secular, those who do not even believe. So I think we reject any kind of a literal, you know, looking at some of those texts that Tag attacks and their connection to the Bible. Well, that's, yeah, unfortunately, as I mentioned, there are extremist settlers living in the settlements. All the settlements are illegal according to international law, but they are there, and these, these settlers, Israeli settlers, who are um, using text that negate, negate, totally negate Palestinian rights. And even they want to negate Palestinian presence. So it's very dangerous. And um, sometimes we feel that the government of Israel uh, is trying to do something about it. But many times we feel that the government of Israel is complicit with that. And that's, again, part of the, what we need to stand against. This is one you've uh, already answered somewhat, but uh, I think it's a good question. Does not the term offspring in regard to Abraham include Ishmael and thereby mandate a place for the Arab descendants of Abraham in Palestine? Now, again, here theology comes to our help. It's not text of scripture. The Muslims, like every one of us, is included within God's love 
and wherever we are in what in wherever land it is all God's land the whole world it's God's world the earth is the Lord's and so I don't think any Muslim or any any one of us needs to be to think that they are going to be excluded so all of us have been placed by God on this earth maybe we are placed in our little section of the earth in our little land but as I also quoted from um, from some of the text uh, from the uh, Church of Scotland or from the church in, in Holland you know everywhere you are you are you are living on God's land you know and this is the responsibility that we have we have to live in righteousness in justice in mercy because we have a responsibility towards God you know so I if 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 any Muslim is concerned about this please don't be don't be we are all living under the mercy of God and all of us are servants of God and all of us are asked to really serve each other in this in, in this world and here our theology of God is very important you know the God that we believe in uh, and some of these scriptures you need to look at it in its own historical context you know and it makes a big difference you know and this is part of the difficulty that we have we have been uh, um, uh, we have been suffering as a result from because these scriptures have been taken selected to drive wedges and to and to uh, oppress us in the name of the Bible and in the name of God and it shouldn't happen because this is not the God that we know the God of love uh, who loved the whole world as a part of that uh, answer could you speak to the Knesset and what it's done recently in establishing uh, something in relationship to the Christians and the Muslims as to their status within the state of Israel yeah again there are extremists even within the government of Israel and they are in I think they're desperate you know this uh, uh, this book that came out by the Presbyterians Zionism unsettled it's a great book and I think we'll be talking more about it uh, in this conference um, and um, I think there are people in the Knesset who want to uh, who, who want to drive wedges between the Christians and the Muslims Israelis I'm an Israeli citizen and I, but I'm a Christian but I have brother, other brothers who are I mean uh, people who are Muslims we are all Israeli citizens but now in the Knesset some extremist uh, members say oh we want to we want to uh, give advantage to the Christians and they want to divide us divide the Christians against the Muslims within Israel I don't know whether some of you have seen what I've written and I think it has been circulated uh, around the world at least our friends you know we know these tricks we know these deceptive ways of driving wedges and I tell you not all of our people back home are mature and strong enough to stand against these things and we are afraid that such a law will divide us but some of us are hoping and we have a responsibility to continue to work for uh, a way of helping people our people transcend that kind of a deception you know it, it totally because we've never been favored by the government of Israel in 1948 they did not come to my town when I was a boy and say are you a Christian you can stay are you a Muslim you can leave you have to leave we were all driven out because we were Palestinians it's not a matter of religion or faith it's a matter of they wanted the land they wanted the Palestinians out we've never been privileged 
by the government of Israel. I can give you so many examples in my life and in the work of Sabil and in what I see around me. So it's a deceptive way of divide. They want to divide us. And some of us are weak and can fall for it. But we need to be aware and we need to raise it and we need to fight it. And the statement that he's referring to that uh, he made is in writing at the Fosna desk in room 202. So if you want to read that, and it's, uh, yeah, take a copy with you. Let me just add one other, one little thing. You know, in the, after 1948, the government of Israel made a deal with the Druze community. The Druze, uh, they're Arabs, like, like us. But they made a deal with them. And so the Druze, Young men go to the army, are drafted into the army. But you know, now after 60 years, many of the Druze don't like the fact that Israel made out of their religion a nationality. So out of Druze religion, now you all find them a special category of Druze. But they're Arabs, like us. And so some of the younger Druze young men are refusing to go to the army. So after 60 years, they're catching up. They're saying, we don't want to be drafted to go kill our brothers and sisters. So no privilege in that sense. Zionism, you know, wanted the land, not the people. And that's the difficulty. Uh, one last thing. What would you like to say to all of us that will, we will take home from Palestine. I tell you, please, friends, and I'm speaking especially here to, the, to those of you who, uh, who see you, yourselves as Christians. Um, our biggest responsibility today, and please understand me in the right sense, not in the wrong sense. Our big responsibility as Christians today is to save the Bible. We usually say the Bible saves us, but I think the Bible is crying out to be saved from wrong interpretations. We cannot make the Bible God's Word. We cannot make God's Word a word of death to people and the word of destruction and oppression to people. The Bible is meant to be a word of God, a word of life, a word of salvation, a word of liberation to people. This is what the Bible is for. And when we have used it in the past and today as well, we're using the Bible as a word to oppress, to violate people's rights, we need to question our theology of God, the God of love. So I would say, please, our great responsibility today, go to your pastor. If he or she are not really helping you understand the message of the Bible, that's why we're in trouble. We really need, the change needs to begin in the church, in the churches. And that's what I would say to you, my friends.